How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. you're watching DNA Today, a multi-award winning genetics podcast where we explore everything to do with genetics from CRISPR to rare diseases to new research. We have won the Science and Medicine Podcast Award for many years now. We have hundreds of episodes and we really hope you enjoy these conversations where we dive into so many genetic concepts. I'm Kira Deneen, a certified genetic counselor and your host. Returning to the show is Dr. Patrick Short, the CEO and co-founder of the health tech platform, Asano Genetics. He has experience in researching large-scale genomic sequencing and rare disorders, and it is Rare Disease Month, so we do have to you know, honor that, so happy Rare Disease Month. Um, for people that are longtime listeners, um, Dr. Short was previously on the show back in 2019, so five years ago, I can't believe it's been five years. That was episode 109, wow. where we chatted about the genetics of autism, which I feel like maybe that's something we need to revisit in the near future because five yeah. years, probably a lot has changed. Yes. But today we are talking about um, the genetics of ALS. So welcome back, Dr. Short. Thank you so much for coming back on. You're always just lovely to chat with. It's great to be here. Yeah, you, it's, I would say the same about you. And I'm a longtime listener of your podcast as well. So it's always great to be uh, able to be an active participant in it. But I love to love to listen as well. You've got such an amazing cast of characters. I'm honored to be part of it. Well, ditto back to you because you host the Genetics Podcast. Um, and I, I can't remember what episode I was on, but I've been on that show as well. So, you know, we bounce around, we pop on each other's yes. shows, which is very fun. Um, but yeah, so we're going to be talking about the genetics of ALS. Um, I figure I should probably start with just how much do we even know about the genetics of ALS? Are there other non-genetic factors we've identified that play a role? Like, what do we know about risk factors? Yeah, great, great question. So um, I'll also start this by saying my background is in population genomics, rare disease genetics. Uh, I'm not an ALS doctor. I'm not an ALS specialist. We've done a lot of work over the last couple of years in ALS. Um but I, I, the lens that I want to take on this is not just the focus on ALS, but also what we can learn about broader rare disease genetics um, from this case. So for those who are ALS experts, listen, if I get some of the details a little bit off, then, then please forgive me. Um, hopefully the perspective I can bring from some of the other diseases that I've worked in makes up for that. But um, for those who aren't familiar, ALS is a neurodegenerative disease. Uh, depending where you live, you also may know it as motor neuron disease or, or MND. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a progressive and in many cases, rapidly fatal disease. Um, and one of the things that makes it challenging, like a lot of the diseases that your listeners will be familiar with, is that it comes in both sporadic and familial and genetic forms. I think it's really important to distinguish those concepts because for a long time, actually, in the field, uh, it was familial ALS and sporadic ALS, meaning it run it ran in my family, and I know my my mother was affected by it or my aunt was, and then sporadic, meaning it's you know it's it's just shown up. But really, those those aren't complete concepts because people who are sporadic can be genetic, and people who are familial can be genetic. Um, and so over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of unpicking of what do we mean. From a terminology perspective, but there's some um, you know heavy hitter genes, really important ones, including SOD1, uh, which is typically point mutations, and uh, C9 or 72, which is a repeat expansion. In different parts of the world, these are at different frequencies, but in Europeans, for example, European ancestry people, C9 uh, or 72 expansions are one of the most common forms. SOD1 uh, is one of the most common forms. SOD1 was uh, was one of the first, I, I believe, actually the first discovered genetic risk factor of ALS. And, and for a long time, there's very little known about the genetics of disease of, of ALS. But over the last um, couple of decades, as with most com you know, common and rare complex diseases, the, the literature has been building and building. And, and today, estimates range between 10 and 15 percent of ALS cases having a, a clear genetic driver, but there's you know discussions we could have about penetrance. Not all of the genes and variants are are completely penetrant, but that's the the rough, uh, I suppose, genetic architecture of the disease. Yeah. And and I think you said it well of just we're redefining a lot of these terms and you know, like sporadic, but you can have sporadic where nobody in the family has it. 
but then we have a genetic factor we've identified that have, you know, led to that. Are the genes that you mentioned, SOD1, um, the C1 C9. you mentioned, yep. yes. Um, so are those like kind of like BRCA is to breast cancer where it elevates your risk or is it like a prediction like you will have ALS in your lifetime? Yeah, so so depending if we take SOD1 as an example, some of the variants are are very high penetrance. So having the gene is it, there's near certainty that you'll develop the disease and and this is one of the you know examples I think to dive into that's particularly challenging from a genetic testing counseling perspective because uh, people go through traumatic experiences where they have watched a family member die of the disease, that family members tested and they carry one of these highly penetrant, fast, fast progressing variants. And then you have a decision, obviously, to make about whether you get tested, whether you get family members, children tested, so on. Um, C9, the C9 or 72 expansion is, is really different, actually. So it drives risk of both ALS, but also FTD, frontotemporal dementia. Um, and it is, uh, most of the literature suggests that it's incompletely penetrant. And some of the recent literature suggests very much so, maybe even 25% penetrant. Um, so it's still a massively elevated risk because it's it's quite rare and and the repeat lengths can vary as well. So generally speaking, the longer the repeat um, expansion, the more early onset and severe disease can be. But di you know, I'm not, I haven't gone into the 40 or so other associated genes that have different levels of penetrance and um, and expressivity, but it is uh, it, it is a pretty complicated picture, which makes, you know, which like most diseases makes having these discussions difficult because depending on the result, the, you know, the, the next steps for a patient would be, would be really different. Yeah, definitely. Just depending on what their risk level is at that point and, you know, what is their personal experience too? Did they grow up where they had a parent that they did inherit this genetic change from that was experiencing symptoms of ALS and how, like, how long did they have symptoms for? Um, and just kind of like how that personally impacted them, I'm sure is, is a really big part of someone's experience of getting that genetic testing. How does, I mean, you mentioned like some other conditions, but how does it compare to say Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease? Like I think of like APOE is something that I think out of all of these genes that we've mentioned, if a layman's person knows one of them, it's APOE. And that might be yeah. because of uh, Thor, <laughs> um, you know, sharing that, um, yes. you know, he has two copies of the E4 that elevates his risk. Um, but uh, Chris Hemsworth, not Chris. No, the other yeah, one. I think it is. Is it Chris? Right? Okay. Liam? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. Liam is Hunger Games. Chris is Thor. <laughs> yes. yes. Right, there exactly. we go. Very important. We get that right. <laughs> um, but yeah, how does it compare to like the other genes that play a role in the other types of neurodegenerative disorders? Like, are we further along, not as far because ALS is not as common, I would say as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Correct yes. me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. Way significantly rarer. I think, um, so where, where are they different? Where are they similar? So there, there are some, um, if we take SOD1 ALS as an example, where it's, uh, significantly different and, and probably more challenging in many regards than APOE4 or LARC2 is the penetrance of the gene is much higher. So APOE4 elevates risk significantly, but there are many SOD1 variants that are nearly completely penetrant. And the age of onset is, you, can, you know, can be 40s, 50s, quite young, maybe into 60s, depending on the variant. The progression can be as quick from first symptoms as 18 months from first symptoms to death or, or even shorter in some cases to some of the SOD1 variants are are slower progressors 10 10 20 years um and so the the, the variability the age of onset with something like APOE4 uh, you're not you're not really looking at elevated risk i think until much later in life um whereas here you're looking at elevated risk potentially in you know what what many would consider kind of the prime of your life um I think the other, maybe on the other side, there has been recently some pretty significant uh, positive developments where there's been a drug approved by, um, so Biogen developed a treatment for SOD1 ALS. And unlike LARC2 or APOE4 that don't have yet approved genetically targeted medicines, there is now, I think, more hope and a, and a better option for people who do test positive and have symptoms. One of the areas that I'm most excited about in ALS neurodegeneration in particular is how we pave the way towards earlier prediction and prevention 
uh, and treating people who are genetic carriers, but not yet, um, you know, symptomatic or early symptomatic. And I think what we'll see in most diseases is you drugs will get approved in people who are symptomatic first. And I think we'll see this in Alzheimer's, we'll see this in LARC2, Parkinson's, GBA, Parkinson's, but that should hopefully pave the way for the next generation of trials that say, okay, we've proven this can, um, this can delay progression or halt progression. Um, but what if we actually treated people two years before symptoms start? And one of the things that ALS does have um, that that is, I think, a, another ray of hope is there's a great biomarker called neurofilament light that there's been extensive research. Uh, there's a um, research out of Miami called uh, Dr. Michael Benatar, who's been working with gene carriers for many years to study the basically pheno conversion, where you go from not having any symptoms to starting to have symptoms to to ultimately developing ALS. And there's a really good biomarker that shows up in the brain, in the blood, uh, you, you know, a, a year or two before symptoms really start. And there's a, there's a trial that's being run right now, actually, also by Biogen, focused on SOD1 carriers who aren't symptomatic yet. So, and we don't see anything like this in Parkinson's or Alzheimer's yet to my knowledge. Uh, and but but I hope this can be a blueprint for the rest of neurodegenerative disease and, and genetic diseases in general, of how can we actually use genetics plus other more predictive biomarkers to identify and treat early rather than waiting until people are are sick. And you know, there's there's frankly very, very much less I think that we should expect to be able to do from an intervention perspective if a lot of the damage has already been done. Yeah, the prevention is so key that if we can start treatment when we, I mean, maybe even before the biomarkers, but if that's kind of what our approach is now of like, oh, we're seeing biomarkers in the blood that, okay, this symptoms are starting to develop, even if someone is not exhibiting that, I guess, if, if there are signs that the disease is starting to progress and begin, then prevention is always going to be better than treatment. So if we can do that, that's like, so such a hope in the community, I think, especially for people that have had this in their family and they're thinking, is this something that I'm going to develop? What is the standard treatment? Like we've talked about kind of the gene targeted, like what's been approved. Um, and I think there was one that was, and maybe it was the one you mentioned that was recently approved. I was, um, one of the other shows I produced called it happened to me. And our most popular episode last year was with an ALS advocate who has blown up online. Her name is Brooke Ebby. Um, she was interviewed by like good morning America. Um, and that's episode 16. I'll put it in the show notes for people for that podcast. But I remember she was talking about like a drug that like was like pending FDA approval or something here in the U S I know you're UK based, but you're from the U S so I know you still have roots yes. here. Um, so what, yeah, I guess like, what is treatment look like now that's standard if someone does not have a genetic change and like what what is kind of in development too yes uh the the caveat that i'll make here is that this is going to vary pretty dramatically by geography individual circumstances but but there has actually been an approved treatment um since i think 1995 there's a drug called really that has very modest uh effect but it's safe and and it has shown to be been shown to be effective so um I think the vast majority of patients would be on really is all once they're symptomatic. I think depending on the doctor that you spoke to, you'd get really different opinions actually of whether you should um, prescribe really is all for somebody who's one of these pre-symptomatic gene carriers. And, and this is a big uh, focal point for some of the patient advocates that that we work with and and that I, um, I think have been doing a lot of really good work. There's two uh, people in particular Gene Swidler and Daniel Barvin, who co-founded a patient advocacy group called End the Legacy, that they're focused around really this pre-symptomatic uh, gene carrier group and and what can the field do to better give them options to 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 try to intervene upstream. Um, and then the the one that I mentioned that is um, uh, the the SOD one gene carrier focus one is called Tofersen, or I think that the the marketing name is Calsodi, uh, and that's that's the Biogen drug, and that one is going to be only for people with SOD1 ALS. But I I think it's probably going to be up to the discretion of doctors whether they make the decision to prescribe it pre-symptomatically, post-symptomatically, and you know that that's something that I would suspect doctors will be monitoring the neurofilament light this biomarker very closely to determine um, is there an you know is it, they've got a balance between dosing someone with something that could have side effects and and could you know and, and could have a safety 
implication too early for you know for no reason versus waiting too late where the where the effect might not um you know where it might be too late to have the the maximal desired effect but i think a lot of that's going to have to be worked out in not just clinical trials but also the real world uh, yeah. real world studies where where we see how these things actually work and I would think guidelines too, like in the cancer world, which I don't work in, but you know, was trained in, like there are things, at least in the US, called the NCCN, um, National Cancer Comprehensive Network. So they provide like here's the guidelines of of what we recommend. And especially genetic counselors are looking at like the testing um and you know what's going to be, you know, recommended. Like someone had ovarian cancer, like they should be offered genetic testing. Is there something like that in terms of like ALS and, you know, guidelines? Because you mentioned like some doctors may say, oh, if you're like a carrier for one of these can like um, genetic changes, that's very high chance you're going to develop ALS. Like let's start you on medication earlier. Or is it just, it's so new that we're just figuring it out. So there aren't set guidelines. Yeah, there, there are, there are definitely guidelines, but the extent to which they're universally agreed and and followed, I think, is um, is questionable. We we launched a genetic testing program called Light the Way, which was focused on both ALS carry ALS patients as well as potential gene carriers. So it's also open to people who um, have a family history. It could be a close relative or or relatively distant relative. We intentionally wanted it to be broad to enable people who are in this often overlooked population of the the potential gene carriers to be able to take part. And one of the things that we found in doing the preparatory work for what gene panels should we select for this study is there's a huge variability um, of what patients receive. Some get only testing for C9 or 72 and SOD1 and maybe a couple of others, a very limited panel, whereas others get quite a comprehensive panel that includes 40, 50 genes, most of which are very rare, but but will show up. Um, we want to make sure that the panel is comprehensive and includes as many genes that are actionable as possible. You also don't want to go too far the other direction and include things where the evidence isn't, isn't really there and, and isn't supported. So there's a, a ClinGen working group that's focused around curating a gene list for ALS and FTD. And I think there's work as well to actually look at neurodegeneration more broadly, because there is overlap between ALS, dementia, frontotemporal dementia, even even Parkinson's, there are shared there's shared risk across many of these, you know, brain, uh, you know, brain, the, the brain, the world of brain genetics, I think we're just still figuring out how this all cascades into into different phenotypes. So in in the UK, for example, there is a national scale genetic testing that's available. In the US, I think it's going to depend a lot on where you're seeing insurance coverage. So it's we found in the US, it's been a little bit spottier. The challenge in the UK is the testing is available, but the turnaround time is still pretty slow. Um, as the testing service is ramping up, they're trying to work out how do we process hundreds of thousands of tests across the country that the UK is uh, really world leading in, gen in genomic medicine, but that's coming with just the scaling challenges of how do we process this many whole genomes in in uh, such a short amount of time. Yeah, I think that is, it's really just great that uh, Sano is able to offer this. And from my understanding, it's a free program. So people that are doing this, you know, either you're eating the cost or whatever, your patients are not paying directly for this service. So when it comes to, and it's called like the way for people that might've yeah. missed that, the Dr. Short said that, um, for in general, when people are looking at doing this testing and not necessarily through you, but just kind of like widening the scope a little bit, would you say most people are symptomatic and then looking for a genetic cause of their ALS or the opposite where there's some kind of indication there's someone in the family and someone's like, I want to know if like I have a genetic risk. Obviously this is going to just kind of like yeah. be what you've seen, but is, is it much more of one than the other? And I expect it to change where it's mostly going to be kind of pre preventative and prediction. But as of now, how do you see kind of that split, at least of like the people that you've talked to and been exposed to? Yes, no, that, that's right. And yeah, to answer the first question about um, it is it is a free program for the first uh, two years of the project. We've had grant funding from the UK government from uh, a great grant program called Innovate UK that oh, wow. uh, companies like us can go to and, and propose ideas like this about developing technologies or services that that uh, the world needs. And, and we'll be looking at the end of the grant funded period to transition into a model where it's funded by health systems, pharma partners, the thought process being that 
um, patients need access to free and rapid testing to, to determine if they may be eligible for clinical trials for approved therapies and and so on. So we're in the grant funded phase of the project right now. And we're, we're try- we've identified a couple of different problems that we're trying to tackle. So if we start with the symptomatic patients, depending on where they're seen, whether it's the UK or the US or Canada or, or anywhere in the world, the experience is highly variable. Some see the best specialist in the country and get comprehensive testing, great counseling, and they they probably don't need our program very much. But more often than not, people are, they may not have access to the best specialist. They may have even difficulty getting a referral to a specialist to begin with. So a big part of the platform is to try to help people bridge that gap between the the standard and the gold standard, if you'd like to think of it that way. So that's pre and post test telegenetic counseling, access to good educational materials through the platform, and so on. So for that's for symptomatic patients, making sure that they they absolutely every symptomatic patient needs to get comprehensive genetic testing. That's the general view of the field. I I should have mentioned this earlier, but this debate between sporadic and familial and genetic, the the numbers are such that more of the sporadic cases if you if you looked at the number of genetic case the number of als cases that are genetic more of them are going to be sporadic patients than familial simply because there are more sporadic patients total so in you know if if you said well we should only genetically test people who have a family history you'd actually miss most of the genetic cases so you need to test everybody is is basically what the field has found like population based um, testing where like someone like me that doesn't have als in my family or at no, least maybe sorry. there was a distant relative yeah. No, no. I mean, anyone, anyone who shows up in a clinic with symptoms, anyone oh, okay. who's, who's, uh, has ALS symptoms, uh, ought to get genetic testing because the, the mistake that some, that, that some made for years was to say, oh, if you don't have a family history, then genetics is really not relevant. And you probably get this in cancer and other fields, right? Where, uh, but actually so many more people show up as isolated sporadic case, or they don't know their family history. Um, and then they do the genetic test and and bang, there's something very relevant there. Um, in some cases, not all, but the, the, so that's like, that's group one, the, the symptomatic individuals, the, by far the more challenging, the one where we had the more, um, you know, vigorous ethical discussions and how to do this correctly is the people who are pre-symptomatic or uh, even we're struggling with terminology here because they may not yeah. become symptomatic, the the potential gene carriers. Um, and these would be people who would have a family member who died of ALS, whether they had or, or was affected by it, um, whether they've had genetic testing themselves or whether the family members had it or not. And uh, we took the approach here to have, again, comprehensive pre-test and post-test genetic counseling and participants can decide to exit the process at, at any point. We've also put together some educational videos with a ALS-focused genetic counselor named Lainey Dratch out of UPenn. Um, and so people can watch these videos before their session so they know. Sometimes people don't even know the right questions to ask, right? They go into the meeting and they wonder, what have I have I missed something that I should be asking in this time that I have with the counselor? Um, and and our, our, the problem that we identified here is that most of these individuals just don't have any access to genetic testing at all because they're, you know, it's not covered by insurance in most cases. Health systems like the UK, you may find a sympathetic neurologist that has the time and ability to work with you for for the, you know, carrier testing. But more often than not, people are just not able to get access to it. So a a research program is a good way to do this. And as a sub study, we're looking directly at impacts on mental health and anxiety of the impact of testing. Because one of the questions we always ran into was this balance between not wanting to do harm. If you get a actionable, if you get a genetic test result that you can't do anything about, but it's told you that you have, you know, for example, high, high penetrance um, risk variant. Uh, But on the other hand, you may identify people who are candidates for this prevention trial and they didn't know it and that could be life-changing in a positive way and we were finding that there was not as much evidence quantitative evidence on what is the impact of genetic testing in this population for good or for bad so our our uh, and i should give a ton of credit to dr paul wicks who's been um really leading the charge on this from our side and in light the ways in many ways his brainchild uh and he designed this sub-study to look at and try to quantify, it's called Beacon is the subset, try to quantify the impact of genetic testing and, and bring some data to this question of 
when we test in a pre-symptomatic population, what, you know, what, what is the impact uh, for better or for worse? And how do we split that out by result? We suspect that people who get a negative result are probably going to feel differently than those who get a positive result. And we'll try to build on the literature that Robert Green and, and others mm-hmm. have done in Alzheimer's and, and disease where they've done return of results and looked at the impact um, in, in that case and try to see what the, what the data looks like in ALS. Yeah, it's very useful and especially I think useful for people like me that are genetic counselors that may be people ordering this type of testing and then processing with patients because it's helpful for us to know like, what is that patient experience? Like, what do I need to be mindful of? For people that are listening that, you know, we have a lot of healthcare providers listen, right? So a lot of people that are kind of in our situation working in genetics in some way, but there also may be people that clicked on this episode because they have a family history of ALS and they're like, I want to know more about like where I'm at. So for people that are in kind of that, um, you know, second category, what is the like inclusion criteria to be eligible to be part of the light the way program? Is it a certain degree relative that needs to have ALS? Do they need to be in the UK? Like what, what is kind of the criteria so that people know, oh, I could actually look into doing this and go to senogenetics.com. Yes. Yeah. The, the criteria is, um, they, they have to have either an ALS diagnosis or a family member who's had an ALS diagnosis, but it is, uh, you don't have to provide proof of that family member's diagnosis. Uh, we've kept it deliberately wide because we don't want to limit access to people for this. And and uh, and it does not have to be an immediate family member. It can be a grandparent. It can be a aunt, uncle. Um, it doesn't have to be a mother or father. Um, so it, it's it's relatively wide criteria from that perspective. Um, obviously, we'd ask that that people who enroll in the study have you know have this in their family. We we don't want to. Um, just do the testing for for people who are looking for it purely out of out of curiosity. Um, the it's live in the U.S. right now, ethically approved and available, and and uh, it'll it should be approved in the U.S. within the next or in the U.K. Sorry, within the next couple of weeks. Um, we're hoping to do many more countries as well. So the grant funding covers us for starting in the U.S. and U.K., but we would really like to also hear from others uh, around the world who think that something like this might be useful in their country, whether you're a nonprofit or a government health system or a, a pharma biotech partner looking about how you do clinical trial access, for example. We in our in our research at the start of the project, we found that there are, you know, the, the US and UK have um have probably the best systems uh relative to their population size for this kind of testing, but there's still a lot of work to do. And for us they're places we're used to operating and that we know we can make a difference, but we want to bring this program as many places as possible because there are many people around the world that don't have access to the gold standard that we think they should have for this kind of program. Well, this is just such an awesome program. Thank you on behalf of the ALS community for offering free testing for people. Um, Very exciting, you know, US, UK, many others to follow. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Shore. It is just always such a pleasure to talk to you. And I like just get so into talking that I'm like, I don't even know what interview questions I was planning because I'm just so engaged with what you're sharing and just so much curiosity comes out of it. Um, so thank you so much. And I really want people to check out your podcast, the genetics podcast. And I'm realizing, um, we are doing a webinar together at the end of the month on February 26th. So for people that want to check that out, we will put a link in the show notes for that. Um, yes. Anything else to mention to people as we close out? I I just want to take a moment on to say on this particular study, one of the things that it has, from my perspective, made it really successful so far is one of the things we did at the beginning was we we created a scientific and patient advisory board. And so that board is chaired by Professor Amar Al Chalabi, who's um at King's College in London and he's uh, you know world world leading uh, ALS. Um, you know, neurologists and, and genetics researcher. The board also includes genetic counselors, patients, um, both those with ALS and those who are gene carriers who who are um, you know pre-symptomatic. Genetic counselors, uh, ethicists, and we found that having that very diverse group of people together to talk through some of these really core principles of the the biggest ones being how do we responsibly extend this testing to people who are um, not symptomatic today and may get a result from this that indicates they've got a high high likelihood of developing ALS. And I just thought that um, it would be impossible to run this kind of study without having that sort of 
collaborative group at the beginning. So I, I suppose the takeaway for the group would be if you're if you're thinking about doing something that's a little bit boundary pushing and different, we found that getting everybody in the room together, actually, we bottomed out a lot of these problems and found a lot, we, we found a lot of things that we thought there would be huge pushback on. Everyone was saying, actually, no, we really need to do this and we, we'll find a way to do it correctly. But, you know, we were expecting a lot of doctors would say there's, you know, we, we, it's too, it's potentially too harmful to do this kind of testing, right? There, the, the downsides of providing this with when there may not be clinical trial options or treatment options is too high. But, um, you know, many of the great doctors in the room said, actually, I think we need to do this and figure out how to do it responsibly. And of course, the patients and patient advocates said, we, you know, we're, we're living with this, and it's our reality, and we absolutely need to do something about it. So I just found it to be really productive to have that group together from the beginning, and not like many studies do, create it in a vacuum, and then show it to patients and participants a year later and find out you made some critical design errors you could have bottomed out from the beginning. That's really good advice to have people involved from the beginning and from so many different viewpoints from, you know, patients, people that may have the condition that are like carriers, as you described, genetic counselors, doctors, researchers, because they're all going to have their own viewpoint with it and their own insight. So I think that is wonderful for people to kind of keep in mind that are starting studies like this and programs. So awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Shore. I'm looking forward to our uh, webinar in a couple of weeks. Um, I believe we are talking about like newborn screening newborn and screening. things along those lines. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Very, very different, but in many ways related. Topic. Yes. Yeah, very yes. much so. Just kind of like, uh, you know, not quite population based, but, uh, you know, kind of uh, almost in that realm. But thank yes. you so much, Dr. Short. This was wonderful. My pleasure. Thank you. It's a pleasure as always. Thanks for watching DNA Today. To access all of our episodes, head over to dnatoday.com. We also have a lot of bonus content on there that you can enjoy. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, guest pitches, you name it, send them in to info at dnatoday.com. We'd also really appreciate if you could take a moment to rate and review the podcast on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to the show. It really helps more nerds like yourself find the show. Also, if you like giveaways and other ways to connect with us, I recommend following us on social. We're at DNA Today Podcast. We also have a Patreon if you want to be the most level involved in the show. That's also at DNA Today Podcast. Thank you so much for listening and watching. Join us next time to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics. We're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. We're all made.